Thomas Wolfe, an American novelist in the early part of the 1900s, wrote that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon, peculiar just to me and a few others, is the central and inevitable fact of human existence. I don't believe that. I don't believe the Bible teaches that, at least on a widespread basis. The world-famous historian H.G. Wells, on his 65th birthday, was quoted as saying, I'm 65 and I'm lonely. Loneliness has been termed as the scourge of the modern age. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about the misery and the mastery of loneliness. The very first recorded problem in the Bible, do you know what it was? Loneliness. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man be alone. So I will make for him a helper suitable for him. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18. What is this state called loneliness that God immediately addressed in his word? True loneliness is more than the simple absence of other people. It is an unfulfilled need for certain types of relationships. Loneliness is not simply a desire for company, but it yields only to very meaningful relationships. Loneliness is not taken care of by social activities or by having someone around. Sometimes those things make matters worse. The severing of a relationship, the death of a spouse, and given the establishment of meaningful relationships, like with God, like with Christians, Loneliness will vanish abruptly, without a trace, as though it never existed. There's no gradual recovery, no getting over it bit by bit. It ends suddenly, one was lonely, one is now not lonely. How do we deal with that? There are many different types of loneliness. And many of these types can be seen in scripture. There is creative loneliness. Loneliness that you create on purpose. And many times that loneliness will last for a lifetime. The creative work in art. Or in science. Or in music. Or in literature. Do you know some of the people that were in those fields, heavily, heavily, uh, heavily involved in those fields, were some of the most lonely people that ever lived? Sermon preparation can be that way because you're by yourself when you're doing that work. Being alone allows you the time to see your work from your own perspective. And those that are in that work to a large degree can end up being lonely. But God does not allow a life like that. Christianity is not lived on an island. It can't be lived like a type of hermit. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light so shine. In order to do that, we have to be among people. Emily Dickinson was a person who was lonely. You recall she was a very gifted poet. Her views about herself vividly clashed with those that were about her. So she decided since she was so out of step with her mid-19th century world, she decided to retire from it. She decided just to lock herself up and write one of the greatest poets that ever lived, but one of the most lonely people that has ever lived. The majority of her poems, if you've read Emily Dickinson, speaks of her isolation, her loneliness, and her imprisonment. The two most basic types of loneliness that we find in God's word are emotional loneliness and social loneliness. Emotional loneliness is when one feels that there's a lack of close, caring relationships. 
The idea that no one cares. Have you ever thought that? Perhaps you're in that state right now of emotional loneliness, just that no one cares. Many biblical characters were in this state of mind, some longer than others. Do you suppose that Joseph felt that nobody cared, perhaps other than God and maybe his father when he was thrown into the pit by his brothers? What about Moses and Job and Elijah? Remember Elijah and how he had those juniper tree blues as he sat under the juniper tree, wondering what Jezebel was going to uh, devise next to take his life? See, these, these biblical characters were emotionally lonely. David, as he's running from Saul. Saul, when he was coming to the end of his reign. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, we, we, we see through it all. Even Christ had his Gethsemane. Uh, I remember singing a, a song when I was younger. It was called In Gethsemane Alone, that Jesus was going to die for the race. There was a type of emotional loneliness. Even later when he, on the cross, he said, Father, you know, why have you forsaken me? But not only is there emotional loneliness in the Bible, there is social loneliness and it's caused by the absence of a social network. Only by re-engaging the person is such a relationship repaired. The withdrawal of fellowship from someone has its roots in social isolation. Family, friends in a neighborhood, in work, etc. These all can be instances where there is social loneliness. In school, do you know how many students in school, social scientists tell us these students are, are just lonely? They don't believe that they have a meaningful social network. I don't have any friends kind of idea. All of us is, have been in one of these states of loneliness in our lives. Hopefully not for a long period of time. Loneliness is a biblical subject. And I hope that we can see the practical nature of this topic, particularly, again, as we consider our state of isolation during this pandemic. And hopefully we've been able to take lessons from the scripture since we've been in this state and have been better able to migrate through it. Loneliness, as we said, hits students. At Stanford University's Health Center, loneliness is the most common problem of students seeking psychiatric aid. More than a thousand students a year seek help for their personal problems of loneliness. And those are the only, those are just the ones that are reported. Loneliness not only hits students and, and younger uh, people, but it hits young married people. Young married couples are very sensitive to the actions of their peer, peer groups. They want to mingle in their peer groups and they're ready to conform to gain that approval. And it's easy to see in young marrieds, even of the church, if their peer group is of the world or is in the church. There is a continuing fear of not measuring up, of not establishing those kinds of relationships. But loneliness also hits middle age. Have you ever heard of the midlife crisis? You know what goes along uh, with the midlife crisis, feelings of loneliness. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not the man or the woman that I used to be. I'm not, uh, I, I'm losing some self-worth, not worth much. Loneliness also, and probably more than any other age group, hits the elderly, especially after a spouse is lost. Many are lonely, but God never intended for any of his people 
to be lonely. We used to sing another song entitled, No, Never Alone. He's promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone, neither emotionally or socially. You know, fellowship is a major biblical theme, wouldn't you say? Remember how Adam and Eve were in fellowship with God and they were thrown out of the garden? Well, guess what? After they were thrown out of the garden, they didn't have a social network outside of the garden. There wasn't anybody else out there. They were not only socially lonely, but they were emotionally lonely because they lost their relationship with God. You know, sin has a way of doing that. It has a way of making us lonely. You know, those feelings that we have when we have disappointed God, and it, sometimes it's even hard to pray because we think that he's not listening or he's not there and that we are alone. Fellowship in the Bible, that, that joint participation. We should be constantly seeking fellowship, to be in fellowship with God and with one another. No one travels the solo route comfortably. Although some people make us miserable sometimes, people, and particularly Christian people, are also a main source of pleasure and of fellowship, and God understood this. I've never been able to understand why a Christian who is suffering from a particular crisis in life decides to stay away from the fellowship of God's people, whether it be a funeral, whether it be some other crisis in life that might bring about loneliness. And sometimes we are our own worst enemies when it comes to that. We make an intentional decision to stay away. It's a fact that those who feel unhappy, empty, awkward, hopeless, also feel lonely. A number of studies also show that those who are lonely are also very likely to be depressed. Those two things go hand in hand. Giving up any hope that you can change your loneliness many times becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you see the situation beyond your control, you continue to be lonely. And that's what the Bible does in such a great way. It indicates to us that we are not a victim of our environment. We are not a victim of circumstance. We are not a victim even of our own minds. But if we see that we can't attain this fellowship that we like, and sometimes it's because we're thinking in a wrong way, we need to repent, we need to change our mind to thinking what brings about great joy as we're studying on Wednesday night in Philippians. And that's being in fellowship with God and with one another. It's the same way with anything that stands between you and God, whether it's faith, whether it's learning God's word or even teaching God's word. That can bring about a type of loneliness if we're not engaged in it. No wonder the Lord wants us to teach others. You know, it's going to be hard to teach others and be lonely. It's going to be hard to have the right relationship with God and be lonely. I can't imagine a Christian ever saying, I am bored. I don't have anything to do. Now, I know most of us have something to do from a physical standpoint. But I mean, as we've seen earlier, we can be doing something physically, but inside be totally lonely. But a right relationship with God and with each other precludes loneliness. It doesn't happen. That's why many of these historians and poets, they didn't have Jesus Christ as the central part of their life. Their work was. You know, and, and your work can be the central part of your life. And if it is, I bet you're very lonely. There is an unfulfilled need with inside. But the Bible teaches us that we are in control if you really want to be. And if we are in control, then guess what? We control our loneliness. An elderly woman asked on one occasion why she didn't share an apartment with another lady to ease her loneliness. You know what she said? 
I'm too old to change. You know, when someone gets too old to change, that should throw up a red flag. They're lonely. You know, many times we ask those who are older and, and sometimes those who aren't older, what can we do for you? And that's a good question to ask, but have you noticed that more times than not, the answer comes back, nothing. You can't do anything for me. Well, you know the one thing that you can do for almost everyone with whom you have that conversation? You can be there. You can talk to them. You can help them through periods of loneliness, which we all experience in our lives. Well, what are the causes of loneliness? You know, there's a type of existential loneliness. And we see this uh, in the life of Solomon as he was performing those life experiences, those life experiments that we don't have to perform. Remember, wine, women, and song. You get as, many of, uh, as much of that as you can, and you will be fulfilled. And wisdom, you get all the wisdom you can attain. You get all the degrees you can attain. You, you, you play and, and have all of the entertainment that you get. And if you can get all these things, you will be fulfilled and you won't be lonely. You know what Solomon said? Solomon said, in essence, I am miserable. I am lonely because I don't have meaningful relationships. But he had, what? All of the women and concubines he could have. You would think, well, one thing he wouldn't be is lonely. Can you imagine having meaningful relationships with those, with, with those many people? And the attaining of wisdom you know, like uh, Emily Dickinson, like uh, uh, H.G. Wells, and all the ones who were lonely, but they were very wise. Why? There is a type of existential loneliness that comes from having an uncertainty of life, which, again, the Bible fulfills that need. Do you suppose that most sincere atheists are lonely, or most sincere Christians are lonely? I think you know the answer to that question, and I think you know why that's the answer. You can be around people. A Christian can be around the Bible, but not have a relationship with the things in the Bible. People can be around other people, but not have meaningful relationships with those people. How many meaningful relationships with people do you have at a large amusement park? Oh, you're around lots of people, but you know you can walk around lonely. A lack of support from one's environment. You know, many children are lonely and their parents don't even know it. Well, do you know how many toys this child has? Do you know how many... Uh, uh, how, how many events and, and things that are in this child's life? Um, you know, I encourage my child to be in sports, to be in school activities, all these things. The environment of the home has been found to accelerate significantly real loneliness. And it's not just because things are around. It's not just because the TV is continually on. That is not going to be the babysitter that the child needs. Most who feel chronically lonely came from homes that were lacking true relationships. Whether it was an absentee father, whether it was a mother at work continually, there was some lack in communication because the parents were so busy, they didn't foster a true meaningful relationship with their children. And so an emotional distance, if not a physical distance, ensued between the child and one or both of his or her parents. Lonely children inevitably grow up seeing that they don't fit in with any group. 
They are the ones that grow up and they attend worship service and they emphasize, well, look at all these cliques at church and I'm not a part of any of them. People are ignoring them. People are sliding them. They're always feeling insecure. This comes from loneliness, true loneliness. You know, I know it's been the, um, the in phrase for years that we need to have our me time. We need to just get away. There used to be a commercial on TV years ago. Remember the advertisement for the, uh, uh, for the bath soap, Calgon. And one wanted to get away from things, and so he wanted to get into the bath, or she, and, and, and they would utter the phrase, Calgon, take me away. Well, there is a time when the Lord needed to be separated for a time. He needed to be away from crowd, and he needed to have his me time. But notice what that me time consisted of. It didn't mean time away from his father. In fact, his me time was probably necessary so he could get closer to his father. Many Christians are lonely because they cut themselves off from their spiritual environment. We have many opportunities to be together. And that is something that needs to be considered after this pandemic is over. I've heard other preachers and I've heard some tell me that, hey, I can get used to this being alone in worship. I can get used to this worship. This is what I really am. You know, this was a concern when the Woodstock Church first put live streaming online for us. You know, it was meant to be, and it still is meant to be, and it will continue to mean to be only for those who cannot, because of a physical ailment or circumstances, cannot be in worship. This is not the ideal situation. This does not preclude that we are not to forsake the coming together or the assembling of ourselves. And so I, I'm hoping you get comfortable with this so that you can have home worship at times where we're not meeting collectively. Because God, know, God knew that we needed that time together to alleviate these feelings of loneliness. Some will come to services and never get involved, leave right after the final amen, not establish too many relationships, and wonder why they're lonely, why people are ignoring them. Loneliness is caused by a lack of support by one's environment but I can be my own worst enemy and in not cultivating or motivating that support. Loneliness also comes from a sense of failure. Does the Bible speak to this? Oh, yes. The Bible says that Jesus Christ has brought us to the glory of God. Well, in doing that, he's taking care of a very acute problem called loneliness. People who have had blows to their self-esteem that have been demoralized and it's made them feel empty, have a tendency to withdraw from others. God knew this. That's why he established the church because he knew that sinful people would be added to the church like me, like you. And in order to get over that sin, in order not to dwell on that sin or those sins, as usually the case is, we need a spiritual network that supports us and our esteem is not based on our past. Well, how did God fix that? He fixed that with fellowship in the church and being with and around one another. That's why sin is so detrimental and it causes loneliness as we see in the first sin with Adam and Eve. You know, those times when we know to do right and we're engaged in that which is wrong or we fail to do those things that we know that we should, what comes upon us then? 
a sense of failure. We take a back seat then, don't we? In our prayer life, maybe in our worship life, certainly in our evangelistic lives, we take a back seat and we don't get involved. Well, guess what that leads to? Loneliness. Rebelling or ignoring God's will brings on isolation. Sometimes we think our prayers don't go beyond the ceiling because we're thinking that way. Remember the prodigal son in Luke 15? When he was isolated from every good thing and he was in that uh, wilderness of waste, he had feelings of loneliness, but he had people all around him. He thought he was going for the good life, but he was isolated from his true source of spiritual fellowship, his father and his spiritual friends. His loneliness, though, brought him to himself. Are you feeling spiritually lonely today? There is something you can do. You can control it. How faithfully active are you in the work of the Lord? Even if you're shut in, you know, that phone works amazingly well. So many things that we can do, even in times of physical isolation, as we have taught now for weeks. God tells us, work out your own salvation. God gives us means by which we can deal with loneliness. What's missing in life? You know, people that are asking that question are lonely. God knows how to make us complete and fulfilled. When a person has truly learned how unfaithfulness reduces one to nothingness and loneliness, it leads him to say, and as we do, sing this song. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take myself and I will be only ever all for thee. If we have applied that simple idea from that great song and from the tenor of scripture, we will not be lonely. Many times we speak disparagingly about people who are ins uh, insincere. Superficial relationships cause loneliness. Do you know people can be married to one another? And if that relationship isn't real, if it isn't faithful, if it isn't trusting, if it isn't what God wants it to be, I believe that people can understand this. You can be married and just be cohabitating and still be very, very lonely. People who may be socially adept on the surface, but who lack deeper levels of involvement and of relationship are lonely. Just because someone is an extrovert and they are the life of the party does not mean that they are not lonely internally. That's why Christianity, listen now, that's why Christianity is a religion of the mind, of the heart, of the spirit. It's not just a religion where we go to church and we go through the ritual formulas. One that does that is very lonely. If that worship service doesn't mean something to him, if he's not worshiping in spirit, in mind, and in truth, that can be one lonely worshiper, even though there are 300 people around. There's no room for superficial relationship in Christianity. That's what takes care of loneliness. Blessed are the pure in heart, pure in spirit, pure in mind. There's no pretense there. For they shall what? See God. That's fellowship. We will see God right now if we are pure in heart, if our spirits are being led by the Holy Spirit of God. You know, Ananias and Sapphira, remember, they, they blew it, didn't they? 
In fact, this is the first example of church uh, discipline in the New Testament church in Acts chapter 5. Remember, they were just playing church. They were making commitments to God. And they weren't keeping those commitments. In fact, the Bible says that they lied to God. Well, you know what that brought about? That brought about loneliness. It brought about a separation of fellowship in a very real way. A number of our values are conducive to loneliness. Privacy. Always wanting to be alone. You know, you remember uh, the piece that Robert Frost wrote, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors? Well, you know, good fences make good loneliness as well. Good solitude. Good fences sever fellowship as well. But sometimes mobility. Our everyday life. We are a going society, aren't we? We're on the go. Go, go, go. Cars. Cars have had a long-standing love affair with many in our country. You know, in the United States, the number of cars increases more, almost twice as fast as the number of people in order to meet our going needs. Many of our cities, like Los Angeles, was built primarily, fundamentally, for transportation and mobility and for cars. Guess which city in the United States, social scientists tell us, is the most lonely? Los Angeles, even though it's the most mobile. Today, supermarkets are designed for top efficiency to get you in and to get you out. And there's no human contact. There's no longer a discussion with the butcher behind the window. Clerks are hard to find. Checkout needs to be in a hurry. You know, the last two places in the community where one might have some social interaction. You know, the barber shop, the beauty shop, now have televisions and have ways that sometimes puts a barrier in our fellowship. Well, everyday life inside the home can be like that too. Remember, we have now the appliances that do our dishes for us. That used to be a two-person job. Remember, honey, you wash and I'll dry. No more. The television is on so often. And, and so everything in our lives are, are engaged in, and many times they cause loneliness. How many times do families sit down and eat dinner together? All of the time pressures that interfere with marital relationships, uh, parent-children relationships, and on and on. We come home tired, we go to bed tired, and that all many times will preclude our getting together. American culture, we need to refocus our values and what it really is and what it means. Jesus cares. Jesus wants this fellowship with us. And it's not just a catchphrase. He left heaven in order to demonstrate that. He left fellowship in a very real sense with God in order to establish fellowship with us. And he was lonely on this earth. But you know what he says? And he says this now as we extend an invitation to anyone who might be experiencing spiritual loneliness or a type of emotional loneliness. And they usually go hand in hand, or even physical loneliness. This is what Jesus said in the Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. When someone is knocking at the door, what are they wanting? To some degree, they are wanting fellowship. They are wanting conversation. They are wanting your attention. He said, if any man hears my voice and open the door, Jesus said, I will come in unto him and I will have a fellowship meal with him. I will make sure that he is not spiritual, spiritually lonely. I will come in and sup with him and he with me. But we have to realize that God cares. Even when we sin, 
When Adam and Eve sinned, the first question that was asked from God is, Adam, where are you? Because I want to be with you. You have left me. And now I want you back. And God wants us back so that we won't be lonely. We have God. We have one another. Social programs won't do it. Just uh, uh, relationships that aren't meaningful won't do it. Isolation won't do it. Just being around people and things won't do it. Only a relationship with God will do it. So will you come into relationship with his son this morning? Either by obeying the gospel or by repenting of sin. Perhaps you've left that relationship. You need to get back into it because you have feelings of loneliness in that prodigal land of sin. If God is not the whole of our lives, we will be lonely. And that's what Solomon said at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the whole matter. Fear God. Respect God. Not be afraid of God. Respect and honor and appreciate God. Literally, Solomon said, watch it, for this is the whole of man. This is the whole of man in order to keep him from loneliness. No, a pandemic and nothing in this life. Age, bewilderment, nothing should keep us lonely very long. You know, the only place where there should be true loneliness and where there is true loneliness, that's hell. And you know why? Because there's no trace of God there. But if there's a trace of God in our lives, and if that relationship is, 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 is intense, there's no loneliness. There's no time for loneliness. God has seen to that. And if you are lonely today, let the bride, as well as the spirit, help you along that line. Thank you for listening. I hope that you all are doing well and are healthy, and we look forward to the time when we can be together very soon. Hello, church family. It's uh, been a while since we got to see each other, and I know I speak for all of us when I say it, it uh, sure will be nice when we get to be back together again, and uh, I, for one, am uh, missing all of you, missing seeing you, and uh, look forward to the time when we can be together again. Uh, also miss... Uh, giving out the starburst to the little ones. Uh, I really miss seeing their faces and, uh, and I'll be so blessed when we're able to uh, do that again. Uh, if you would, let's, uh, let's uh, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the many blessings you give us each day. Father, we're thankful for the blessing of your son that uh, he was willing to, to die on our behalf, that we can have a hope of eternal life. Father, for the blood that he shed, that uh, we can uh, have that uh, salvation, uh, that our sins can be forgiven. Father, we're mindful of those that are sick, those that are having a difficult time. Uh, Father, especially those that uh, are dealing with the separation. Uh, Father, we pray for those. Uh, we pray that we'd be comforted in this difficult time. Uh, but Father, help us look for ways that we can be of service to you in this time and and uh, bring the good news to others. Uh, Father, help us to use this unique uh, time in our lives to uh, reflect on the blessings that you've given us and not take for granted those things that uh, we enjoy each and every day. Uh, Father, be with those that are, are suffering with this uh, virus. We pray that you give them healing, give them their health back. Uh, Father, we pray that you'd be with our leaders that are uh, making decisions on our behalf. Uh, Father, guide them, give them wisdom, uh, help them to make the right decisions that would be a, a benefit to uh, our communities uh, and to our nation. Uh, Father, we pray that you would be with our congregation as we uh, struggle with the difficulty of being apart. Uh, Father, help us to reach out to one another and to uh, embrace one another as best we can. Uh, help us to support one another. We pray that you'd be with us and, and uh, help us to uh, get through the situation uh, as soon as possible. Father, we pray that you would uh, rid our, our country of this virus or uh, help us to combat the virus to the point where uh, we can resume uh, a normal life. 
Father, we pray you be with us and protect us. We ask all these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for uh, uh, continuing to worship, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon.